Um, and we're live. I'm Claire Howard. You saw me at the beginning, but now I'm um, really here and I'm very pleased to be joined by artist Suzanne Bocanegra. Hi, Suzanne. Um, I'll give a little intro first for Suzanne and her, um, and her career. Suzanne earned a BFA from the University of Texas at Austin and her MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute in California. She's a recipient of a 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship the Robert Rauschenberg Award from the Foundation for Contemporary Art and the Rome Prize. She has also received grants and fellowships from the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the McDowell Colony, the Tiffany Foundation, Joan Mitchell Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts and the New York Foundation for the Arts among many others. Her work has been presented in solo shows at Art Cake Brooklyn, the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia, the Francis Young Tang Teaching Museum and Art Gallery and at Site Santa Fe and in group shows internationally. Her performances have been presented at venues including the Museum of Modern Art New York, Countercurrent Festival in Houston, the Fusebox, Fusebox Festival in Austin, UCLA's Center for the Art of Performance, Brooklyn Academy of Music's Next Wave Festival, Marfa Live Arts, Mass Mocha, <laughs> Walker Arts Center, the Wexner Center, Pulitzer Arts Foundation, and the Fisher Center for the Performing Arts at Bard College. So a, a beautiful list. Her recent work involves a large scale performance and installation, frequently translating two dimensional information, images and ideas from the past into three dimensional staging, movement and music. In spring 2022, she will debut a new work titled Honor, an artist lecture by Suzanne Bocanegra starring Lily Taylor, which was commissioned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So welcome Suzanne, thank you for being here tonight. Okay. Um, and I'll just uh, remind our audience, don't forget about the Q&A window to the right of your screen. We welcome you to submit your questions and Suzanne and I will do our best to get to as many as we can during this live Q&A portion of the event tonight. So um, just to get things rolling, Suzanne, in terms of our discussion, um, maybe first what we could do is, um, you know, as, as a curator, someone who's been to many artist talks, and I'm sure you've gone to many artist talks as well. You know, there are elements in When a Priest Marries a Witch um, that are kind of recognizable parts of the traditional artist lecture. You know, there's the slideshow, the narrative about kind of, this is how I came to be an artist. These were significant shifts in my work or in my development, these were milestones. But the crucial difference is that it's not you. Um, delivering this narrative about your development and your work. So would you mind sharing how you came up with the idea of the artist lecture and how the format has evolved over time in your subsequent lectures? I have some images we can show of um, other lectures that, that you've done. If you wanna, I can pull those up. All right, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, all right. So um, what happened is, I guess it was almost 10 years ago uh, Larry Kardish, who's a curator at the Museum of Modern Art, had seen my uh, Re Remember piece, which is the piece that ended this uh, performance. And he asked me to give an artist lecture at the museum uh, about my work. And so I started thinking about what was really behind that piece, Re Remember. And then I realized. Um, it went way back to when I was a kid and what happened at my wacky Catholic church. And it was a, a story that I told different friends along the way, but I'd never made a piece about it or, or uh, you know, talked about it in any kind of lecture or in any public way. And so I started trying to do that. And um, when I finished, it ended up being a story and so then after I'd finished it, I thought, well, I, I wanna uh, really um, put this story over in a really kind of an emotional way, which uh, doesn't necessarily happen with an artist lecture. You're kind of removed usually. And so I thought, well, I need a professional. And so I called Paul Lazar, who 
is a great actor and he happens to be my best friend's husband. So I said, Paul, can you do this for me? And he said, yeah, sure. Fine. And so then we started working on it and he works with the Wooster group and they use that in-ear device a lot. Uh, Liz Lecomte, who's the director, uses it um, in order to shape her actor's performances and she uses it in all these creative ways. We kind of started using it because he only had a, a couple days to put this together and there's no way you could memorize it. But then as we started rehearsing it, um, it started, um, it was interesting to hear my voice and then how he interpreted my voice. And also to make it clear that it was, um, it sort of showed the scenes a little bit to make it clear it was me and him together. And so uh, in those first performances and you see it on this um, film, we had my voice in the hall on speakers and he was um, saying it live. So that's how we worked it in the first performances. And then later, oh, so so we it was gonna be a one-off. I was just gonna do it one time. And then uh, actually Paul said afterwards, he said, you know, I think this kind of works as a theater piece. And so we started doing it at different experimental theater festivals and, um, at one of them, uh, Frances McDormand and her husband Joel were in the audience and they came up to us afterwards. They loved it. They took us out for beers afterwards. And somehow I had the chutzpah to say, uh, Fran, um, I have another artist lecture. I want to do another story to tell. Uh, would you be interested? And she said, yes, I'll do it. And she pointed at Paul and she said, and you're going to direct. And we actually did that. And then after we did that one, that was about my body cast as a teenager. Then after that, uh, I've done another one, Farmhouse Whorehouse, which is about my grandparents' farm in LaGrange, Texas, and uh, the very famous whorehouse across the street, which is a ranch, best little whorehouse in Texas. And it's also um, more of an essay about um, back to the land and uh, hippie communes and um, my first exposure to art as a teenager, being French Impressionist and not realizing all those pretty ladies were prostitutes and all kinds of things. And um, we're actually going to be filming that in a couple of weeks at the Guggenheim's Theater. And um, so it just kind of went from there, you know, just as kind of progressing. And then the new one uh, that's happening February 19th uh, at the Met is uh, about a 16th century tapestry. Uh, the largest tapestry that the Met owns, and it's uh, 69 characters all demonstrating the concept of honor. And this is the first time uh, I'm not starting from a personal story. There's a lot of personal stories woven in it, but it really is starting from this particular tapestry. So uh, it just kind of snowballed. And I have, um, I have some pictures here. I'll share my screen um, and we can show Oh, I don't know if I, maybe I can't share the screen, um, but maybe uh, Zach, if you could make me the um, co-host, I will share my screen. But otherwise we can talk a little bit about, um, for the Farmhouse Whorehouse performance, I've noticed you're actually, you're on the stage. And is that um, kind of a, what was, you know, part of the decision what was the, the decision making between kind of shifting yourself to um, being on the stage as opposed to this kind of like disembodied voice that you are in uh, the performance we just watched? Well, you know, the great thing about doing live theater is that you can kind of reshape it each time you do it. Somehow we decided to try it that way where I would read the lecture live instead of having it recorded. And then it would go into um, Paul's ear in real time. And it just worked out so much better. And um, it, it put this whole other element into the performance because one of the exciting things about live performance is that you can make lots of mistakes and the audience knows that or anything can happen. It's a live performance. And, um, and it's interesting because there always are a lot of mistakes because um, sometimes he can't quite hear me or maybe I've changed uh, a line and it does it make sense to him? And so there's, there are moments when he has to stop and ask what's going on and what was that line? And 
it's an interesting thing that happens with the audience because they always love that part. They always, that's their favorite part because it's a reminder that it's a live performance and it's a reminder that you can mess up, you know? So um, it just, that's, um, that's how it happened. Oh, that's great. Well, I can, um, I can share some of those images so everyone can see what we're talking about. Um, okay, so, um, See, here's an image of Francis McDormand in body cast, which as you said, is kind of a reflection on the time you spent in a body cast as a young teenager, correct? Is that? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, it's about body cast. It's also about, um, it goes into a lot of different things. This is a demonstration of a piece that I did called Little Dot. It originally uh, was commissioned by the Tang Museum. Um, and uh, I did a little excerpt of it and uh, Fran is explaining it there. And um, it was also, um, since this is at a, a University of Texas venue, there's a big part of it that's about uh, when I first saw the plaster casts of all the Greek and Roman statues and they were kept in a closet uh, at, in the tower at that point. And our TA for a beginning art history class took us up there. It was a time when you couldn't go into the tower. It was all locked up. You had to get special permission. I don't know if that's still true or not, but um, it was it was this amazing experience to see all these replicas of all this Greek and, and Roman statuary. It, it's, I mean, it's cast off of the original. So you get that same sort of experience, but it's this beautiful chalky plaster. So anyway, I talk about all kinds of things like that in, in the body cast piece. And those replicas are actually at the Blanton now. So, um, and then here you are, this is what I was talking about, um, what I just alluded to in Farmhouse Whorehouse where you're visible on the stage. So there's this kind of added, you know, uh, level in which as you were saying, the seams are showing. Yeah, and um, yeah, we always wanted the seams to show in, in some way, shape or form, but uh, um, I think it was, when we got to this point that we realized this was the, the kind of, cause you could, you could see me and hear me. Although the way we set it up now is that um, um, the actor's voice really dominates. And, um, and the way I had it before with the recording is I kind of wanted tension between the recorded voice and the real voice. So they kind of uh, fought each other. and. At the time, I liked that, but as time has gone on, I, I, I'd rather have it this way where um, my voice is softer and it's unamplified and the actor kind of takes over. Great, great. Well, I'll, um, I'll stop sharing and we can take some audience questions. Um, so we had one that kind of ties into something I wanted to talk about with you. This was a question um, uh, from Logan, and he's asking about Valley, uh, the video that we currently have on view at the Blanton. Um, and maybe you can tie this into your artist lectures as well. Um, Logan asks, can you speak about the process of directing the actresses in Valley? Were they watching it, meaning Judy Garland's wardrobe test, um, okay. as they acted, or did they have it memorized? And maybe, you know, while you're discussing that, you can talk about the connection between the artist lectures and Valley. Um, both kind of technically, you know, in terms of maybe the earpiece um, that's visible in both Valley and the artist lectures, but also kind of in your larger exploration of performance through these works. Um, well, Valley was different because they were trying to recreate the movement and um, recreate um, what Judy Garland was saying in the wardrobe test and also the timing. Uh, we recreated the, the lighting, the carpet, uh, every, we were trying to do everything as close as, as possible, and the costumes, obviously. Uh, we were trying to do everything as close as possible. So the way to, that we did that was um, they have an in-ear thing, so they hear Judy's voice and they mimic it as close as they can. And then um, there was a movement coach, uh, Elizabeth Dement, and she, um, She's a dancer herself, an amazing dancer. And she also has been working a lot with uh, teaching people movement like she did um, with Annie B. Parsons. She did the uh, that David Byrne thing, uh, Utopia that's on Broadway. So she helped teach all those musicians how to move for that. So she knows how to do this. And so 
she would work with them and, and each each um, performer was filmed. We only had half a day with each one. And so um, she would quickly go over the movement. And then we would also have um, a, a screen flipped so they could see how Judy was moving. And then also uh, Lizzie would be off camera with her back turned to them. And she was also um, doing the movement. So they had several um, things that they could cue off of. So um, that's how that worked. Yeah, and I'll, um, I'll share my screen. Um, and we have a few kind of behind the scenes images of the making of Valley that we'll go back to. Just click through here. Um, these are that's the fabric workshop. They made all the costumes. Oh yeah, and that's, uh, you can see Lizzie, Lizzie's working, just they're doing a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So you can see practicing the, the movements. Again, probably has Judy Garland, the wardrobe test pulled up on that laptop. Right, yeah. Um, we see again. And this is a great video. I'll show this little clip. It's Alicia Holman. Three, two, one. So we, we recreated all the um, the technical people too. I played the, the role of the director. And so we had to, um, we had to rehearse all those parts, you know, us coming in at a certain time and um, uh, crossing in front of the camera at a certain time, all of that. And so they were, so what we're seeing here is Alicia Hall Moran is able to refer both to Elizabeth Dement, the movement coach, but also to a laptop that we can't see in this shot that's playing the Judy Garland wardrobe test. And then she has an earpiece with Judy Garland's voice in her ear to kind of feed her the lines. So in that way, there is that connection to your artist lectures. Yeah. And how are you thinking, you know, in terms of, um, how does your thinking about performance in these works shift from having, you know, a single actor kind of inhabiting your, you know, you, but they're not necessarily, you know, acting like you, they're not, you know, imitating your voice or anything like that, um, to the eight different women that you cast in Valley, all of whom are kind of putting their own spin on Judy Garland. Like um, Alicia Hall Moran is someone who I think is really, channeling Judy Garland, you know, in her facial expressions, she has this kind of, you know, very kind of over the top um, persona that Judy Garland had. Um, but then you have someone who's, you know, much more deadpan like Ann Carson and kind of doing herself. Um, so how does your thinking about performance and, you know, the tension between the performer and the role kind of shift from the artist lecture format to Valley? Well, I think part of what happened was, um, I was really fascinated by seeing how actors worked, you know, to see how they would take my text. And, um, and we also worked with, I mean, Paul worked as a director in one piece, Lee Sunday Evans uh, worked as director on the um, last piece, Farmhouse Courthouse. And then um, talking about shaping different lines, uh, of where to hit, uh, how to hit certain words. Um, and then also, how the actors would um, interact with the audience and, um, and how they would kind of take the pulse of the audience. I mean, the whole business of uh, performing really fascinated me. And also how much of their own personality is just, I mean, for the performance to work, their own personality is somehow 
washes over the whole thing. Um, I think for it to be um, a seductive performance. So anyway, with this piece, which was, um, it, it has a whole different concept uh, and it has a whole different kind of relationship to time because it's not live and it's made for a gallery or a museum. Um, it was my way to kind of explore how all these different kind of performers would interpret material and what they would do with it. And um, like, if you see Kate Falk, she really gets the movements down. I mean, even the head bobble and everything. She's just like, she is amazing with that. And then you'll see uh, Carrie Mae Weems injects so much of her own personality into it. And it becomes a very big and kind of broad interpretation. Yet they're all doing the same movements and they're all doing the same lines. So um, it, it's almost like um, kind of like a sampling of how all these different people coming from different performative worlds interpret uh, this material. And I find that so interesting. So um, did, did that answer your question? But I, it's also dealing with this piece, the ballet piece is also dealing with time in such a different way because um, in a performance, you know, you come, you sit in your chair, you know, you wait for the thing to start. It lasts however long it lasts. And, and then, and, and usually it's longer than a few minutes, you know, usually it's at least 45 minutes, an hour, maybe even longer. But when you're, um, when your audience in a gallery or a museum, your experience is to walk around and you decide how long you're going to stay in front of something. Mm -hmm. It's completely your choice. And, um, and I find that I'm not prepared to spend half an hour, an hour in front of something. You're there to see lots of things and you decide how long you're going to stay. So this wardrobe test is less than five minutes. So it, you can get the whole thing in less than five minutes, which I, thought time-wise is perfect for a gallery audience. Yet, if you choose to stay and see it looped, you can do that too. And, um, and also, you know, you can take in each person. Um, so, so it deals with time differently because it's a different kind of audience. In terms of your, your dealing with time, that kind of leads into another question that we received from the audience. So Logan, asks, what is the process of re-remembering in your work? We saw a clip of re-rememberer. Um, what takes precedence in your work, memory, fact, or the in-between? Well, I start with memory mm -hmm. and I try to be as factual as I possibly can. But a lot of times I find out later, actually there's another thing in the piece that you just heard um, that I remembered too, uh, when a priest marries a witch, uh, the bio that was right beside us, it wasn't a sewage ditch. My mom said after she saw the piece, she said, that was not a sewage ditch, that was a drainage ditch. And so there's like a lot of things that I remember in a certain way, I remember her saying that it was sewage ditch. No, 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 I was wrong. And so there's, but I try to be as accurate as possible, mm -hmm. but you know, you're never gonna be exactly accurate, you know? So, um, but I start with my memory and then, um, and then I, I, uh, I try to fact check myself, I guess. So uh, it's, it's so often fact is more interesting than fiction. And, you know, sometimes it's less believable than fiction. But um, yeah, that's- and It sounds like research is part of that fact checking that you've spent time in the archives of American art, looking at the Bob Fowler papers, kind of digging up you had a lot of documentation um, yeah, yeah. of your memories, you know, that kind of backed up and gave, probably fleshed out the facts. Uh -huh. And I interviewed him. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, the more you, I mean, there's a lot of information that I found, I found out at the Archives of American Art that, I, you know, I couldn't put it all in there. It's, you know, the story just gets too, too complex. So, um, and also I wanted to stick to my story in a way, because it really was about me as an eight-year-old girl and what I saw. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that, and, and they all, all the pieces are really coming from my point of view and what I was experiencing and what I saw. But then I try to, to make sure that I get 
uh, what was happening in the world as accurate as possible. Right, right. And then um, I guess we have, we have another question that came in. Um, this is from Richard Bisk and he says, you have the live actor, the voice, your voice um, and, and other roles um, in your performances. And I guess this is as we're thinking about translating theatrical performances into filmed works since you're about to start filming Farmhouse Whorehouse. Um, he asks, why not have some audience on screen as well? Um, uh, let's see, on, that, on this particular piece um, for the When a Priest Marries a Witch, I really didn't set out to be making a film. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was uh, I wanted to get documentation of the piece. And so uh, I hired uh, this guy um, to just put some cameras up. And during uh, a couple of performances, he just um, shot it. And when I saw the results, it just killed the piece. It, mm -hmm. it, just, it was so... Um, it wasn't even worth having as a document. So in order, I thought to just have a good record of the piece, I ended up doing all this other stuff, like hiring a professional editor and hiring a couple of cameras. And then this uh, guy who's, who's still putting together this next film, Drew Hopped, um, found um, this, uh, this amazing DP and all this kind of stuff in order to get a really good document of the performance. And that's how that happened. And so at the time, that's all I was going for. And if you look, and, and sort of my models at the time, I don't know if you know Spalding Grace swimming to Cambodia, which is uh, Jonathan Demi did that as a, uh, a film of his piece at the performing garage. And if you, if you notice, it starts out, he walks in front of an audience but then it's clear, I mean, you don't think about it, but that audience is never there from the rest. You know, you just see him walking out and that there's an audience. So it establishes the fact that it was done in front of an audience, but the rest of it is just, you know, him doing it. And uh, and I'm sure doing it multiple times and having it, you know, all edited, all these things that you can do on film that you can't do live. But um, that was something that we were talking about uh, when we uh, filmed it at the Guggenheim but because of COVID, we can't have an audience. And um, I thought, well, that makes, because we were thinking about, you know, would we want to have an audience and see their reactions? And, and the other thing that happens in an audience is you get laughter because there's a lot of places um, that get laughs. And, and we, we've done it so many times, we know exactly where the laughs are going to come. And when you don't have an audience, this, it just, you don't have laughs, you know, and and it doesn't necessarily read as funny when you see it on a screen. So, um, but I think because of COVID, we're not going to be able to have that. And then I thought, well, that's that's okay because it's it's also kind of taking place in this very strange time. And uh, the Guggenheim Theater is this very interesting kind of sculptural object almost because it it it's uh, it mimics the whole shape of the Guggenheim. And so I thought, well, maybe somehow. Um, I can talk about that and put that into the piece. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think it's it's so interesting how how these these lectures continue to evolve and respond to their, you know, respond to the their contexts and um, and it's really um, become such a fruitful investigation and then, you know, kind of taking certain uh, aspects of the lectures and moving them into the video format um, with Valley. I'm kind of curious what what the video format allowed you to do that maybe you hadn't been able to do in, in your theatrical presentations? Mm. Well, it's, it's a whole different kind of relationship to the audience. Mm -hmm. And also um, you can surround them, you know, you can, um, and that's why I wanted at least eight performers. And in my mind, I was thinking of it as like a, a Greek chorus for uh, Judy Carlin's life. Um, it's just a different kind of aesthetic that you can present to the audience. And um, yeah, that's cool. Well, I think um, we've gotten through all of our questions um, for this evening. So I will um, kind of begin our outro. Um, 
by asking everyone um, to please join us for our next curated conversation, which is um, contextualizing Black is Beautiful, a UT faculty panel. This is presented in conjunction with the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy on Tuesday, September 7th at 5 p.m. Central Time. And those registration details can be found at blantonmuseum.org backslash events. And we would also like to um, remind and invite you to visit the Blanton Museum of Art to experience Suzanne's immersive video installation, Valley, which is on view through September 19th. If you'd like to show your support for the museum, you can become a member or give gift of membership at blantonmuseum.org backslash membership to always be in the know about the programs um, that we're doing like this and other news, sign up for our newsletter at blantonmuseum.org backslash subscribe. For details or to watch past curated conversations, go to blantonmuseum.org backslash curated conversations. And finally, if you'd like to help us keep bringing programming like this to our community, we welcome your donations at blantonmuseum.org backslash pay what you wish. Um, and thank you so much, Suzanne, for being here tonight and for sharing your work with us, both um, this artist lecture that we saw tonight, as well as Valley. Um, I know I've, I've really enjoyed talking with you and thinking about, um, about your work in, in both of these, both of these formats. Um, and I want to thank our audience again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next month. Bye. Bye. <laughs>